dropping in all the time. So um, thank you very much. And I will hand over to you. Hello. Is that loud enough for everybody? Thumbs up. Yeah, good, good. Thank you very, very much for asking me, Nikki. Um, this was quite a big ask because it's healthy voice use over the lifespan in 50 minutes. So what would normally take me about two weeks to talk through, we're doing it in 50 minutes. We've got something like a minute and a half per year. Um, no, we've got less than that. <laughs> a year, year and a half per minute. Right, off we go. I'm going to share my screen because I've got some slides. Um, as for questions, if you've got questions, pop them in as we go because I might be able to sort of weave the answer into what I'm saying. So do, do put in your, your questions. Let's just go to share the screen and share the sound. And let's just whiz that in, take that across, and we should be. Okay, you got that. So this is the life of the voice, healthy voice. So I'm going to start with just a few, a really small number of um, bits of advice for healthy singing because some of you will have a very in-depth knowledge of how your voices work, some of you may not really have much idea, some of you will have been introduced to ideas from different people who may have different ways of explaining things. Um, so I'm just making sure that we've all established a bit of a baseline here. Base as in B-A-S-E, not the bottom line of the part, singing parts. So a few things to iron out really. The first one is that the two, two of the main things that we use to make sound, or to help us to make sound, we can't feel at all. We have no feeling coming back from them. You can't feel your diaphragm and you can't feel your vocal folds. So that leaves us in a bit of a pickle because we've got to try and generate all of this sound and manage it and control what we're doing, relying on feedback from elsewhere in the body, which is okay, we can do it. So linked to this, the, the, the sort of flip side of this is that when everything's working really well, we don't feel very much at all. If we're feeling a load of stuff going on in our throat, in our mouth, in our larynx, in our body, we're probably overworking. Yep, singing well, singing healthily should feel like no big deal. It is a big deal, it's a hugely complex thing to do, but it won't feel like effort. And of course, if we try to feel something, if we if we concentrate on a certain part of our body, of our mouth, of our throat, anything like that, we're probably going to get in the way and cause problems. This is probably the most important bit of advice. That if any, if you're ever in doubt, just get things moving. Now, movement is a relative term. Yeah, if you've got a load of school kids, you can get them leaping up and down doing star jumps and that's fine. If you're working with a choir of older people who may have limited mobility, then you know you, 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 it's a relative concept, but everybody has got the ability to move a little bit. And keeping things moving is going to be the best way to balance function. Um, that is moving head and neck like this, small movements while you sing. As you hear my voice, my speaking voice is not particularly affected by this. It still carries on functioning perfectly well. Uh, if I do massive movements then it's going to get a bit disruptive and it'll get jerked out of out of alignment and that's not going to be helpful. But small movements, small movements of the shoulders, always useful. 
um, small movements of the hips. I love getting my singers to do hula hoops of the hips just to make sure they're not gripping onto anything in their in their torso. You know, it's a very common issue that singers will grab on to the middle here and hold on tight. So wiggling the hips stops you from doing that. Sometimes I put my students on a wobble board or a physio ball and just then they can't help moving. They have to move. We're now going to look at babies. Why do we look at babies? We're not teaching babies how to sing. But, hang on a minute, I'm just going to lift this up. I just forgot to raise this earlier. There we go. Um, when we understand what the infant voice and larynx and breathing mechanism is there for, we understand why the child voice is different from a mini adult voice. And that's important to know when we are working with children and working with their voices. So where do we start? We start with the newborn. And the newborn has got, to summarise very quickly, a larynx this bit here that sits much much higher in the vocal tract. If a baby opens their mouth wide you can often see the epiglottis wiggling around at the very top of the larynx. It's very high because it makes it much much more efficient for swallowing. It's a much better valve for protecting the airway and that's that's a pretty important thing to get right from birth. If you get it wrong you know you haven't got much hope. Um, so swallowing with a very high larynx. The larynx itself is a slightly different structure because it's again better at valving. The lungs are not only of course you're smaller because you've got a smaller being but they're relatively small. The respiratory rate of a, of a newborn is about 50 breaths a minute the respiratory rate of a healthy adult is 10 to 15. So they're breathing much more rapidly um, because they don't need big lungs. Uh, what they need to do is to be able to produce a short, loud sound. They don't need either sustained speech, which is what I'm doing at the moment with my lung capacity, or aerobic function, which is what I did this morning when I went for my run. I needed to get enough oxygen in and carbon dioxide out to sustain that much time running, which a baby doesn't do, doesn't need to do. Yeah, doesn't sustain aerobic function, so they don't need big lungs. What they do need is as much digestive capacity as possible so they can consume loads of food and grow a lot. So the baby makes short, loud noises that attract our attention and has a high larynx for suckling efficiently and relatively small lungs. So that's great for the infant. They're born with the right gear. When we start to speak, we need a different priority from all of that equipment. And it develops gradually over time from about a year to adolescence. Yeah, quite a lot of change in the first four or five years. You notice that from observing children's speech patterns. Um, but from then onwards there are still growth changes, the larynx is lowering, the articulatory coordination is increasing and improving. There are changes. And this is why children's voices are not mini adult voices because they've still got a higher larynx, they've still got smaller lungs, they've still got a slightly different distribution of cartilage and membrane within the vocal folds. Things are all a little bit different, so the expectations are slightly different. This is to summarise the vocal ranges, the average vocal ranges of children's voices. So we have the cross, which is the 
average speaking pitch of the voice. And then we have the filled notes, which is the speaking range or the modal singing range. So that's why if you listen to my voice, I'm going up to about there sometimes and I'm going down to there sometimes. But I don't go beyond that unless I'm incredibly excited or singing. Um, the, the unfilled notes are the extended range. Now, the, the upper range is hugely, hugely variable. It depends on the individual. It depends partly on the flexibility and structure and part mostly on habit, on how much they use those parts of their voice. If children get used to using the upper range in their voice and never stop using it, it's always there. The thing to note, of course, is the lower limit, which is pretty fixed from individual to individual. Our lowest comfortable singing note is always about a third below our speaking pitch, which is a really useful guideline to know if somebody's speaking voice is slightly out of kilter. So if they're holding their speaking voice a bit lower than they should be, or if they're holding it a little bit higher than they should be, you can evaluate that by finding out their lowest comfortable singing note and going from there. And of course it's very useful, as we'll find out later, when we are evaluating boys changing voices. So the lowest note is fairly fixed. So if you're doing music with preschool children or reception year children, if you look at that, they can't get lower than middle C, which for a lot of primary school teachers will be the middle of their comfortable range. So it's really, really important that we bear that in mind when we are singing with children of that age, that we don't ask them to go lower than they can. Because what they'll do, they'll just grumble or shout. If they can't pitch match, they won't, they'll just provide the words without the notes. The differences therefore that we will have with children, to summarise because I've only got a small amount per year, um, pitch range which we've talked about, length of phrases, smaller lungs, all right they're not going to be able to sing such long phrases it's obvious really, but sometimes we're asking children to sing repertoire that's written for adult voices. So let them breathe more often. That's all it is. Let them breathe. It's not a crime. Um, muscular coordination. So how might that present itself in young voices? Things like accurate pitch jumps. If we're asking them to sing something that is quite angular and jumps about, they may not pinpoint it very accurately. The um, singer who's not very used to singing would also be the same. The more you do it, the more skilled you get. Um, also fast notes, singing fast notes, which, you know, any musical style will have rapid passages, little florid bits, little twirly twiddly things. Loudness. I know they can seem pretty loud at times, but actually they're not as loud as an adult. So if they're trying to compete, they're going to get tired. Um, and stamina. Again, really, really important. Children don't have the physical stamina that adults have. Adults have protection built in. I've just been um, uh, watching my son doing orchestra rehearsals and in the youth orchestra sometimes they were going on for four hours with a five minute break you wouldn't be allowed to do that with a professional adult orchestra and yet this was with kids yeah because they're kids they don't have any legal protection so we have to really bear that in mind don't make them sing for too long just because you haven't planned your rehearsal properly I've got a few little hints, helpful hints for technical things that we may find as issues with children's voices and anyone's voice, but children may present with breathiness. Um, 
breathiness in in any voice actually what causes the breathiness is a leak in the system the vocal folds come together they, they're in here in your larynx they run from front to back they come together um, and they vibrate in the airstream if there's a gap either in the middle or sometimes at the back there's a bit of air leaks through and we hear that as breathiness the gap can be there either because the muscles are not working in coordination very efficiently so they're not pulling the vocal folds together the gap can be there in older voices and I'm talking much older voices sort of 75 80 plus you can get breathiness there because the muscles are beginning to get weaker and the vocal folds themselves are made of muscle and that can atrophy in the older voice so that can be another reason why you get a gap in the middle you get a gap at the back because it's more difficult to coordinate that closure and the higher you go the more difficult it is to coordinate which is why you tend to get breathiness in the upper register uh, because the muscles that are pulling the vocal folds longer to raise the pitch also pull them apart and you've got to get other muscles to come in and pull them together again it's as simple as that it's just coordination so the first thing we can do is a little bit of breath management so we're not shoving a load of air through right if you shove too much air through your larynx you will make a breathy sound so that's the first thing to do how do we work on that with children blowing through straws blow just blowing onto your hand long gentle humming exercises blowing through a straw in water which is absolutely brilliant if you push too much air through that one the water splashes up and hits you in the face so that's very useful biofeedback um, you can do things like have a little square of paper you know a little square about an inch square um, and blow put it on the wall and blow and keep that square pinned to the wall with your breath if you blow too hard you blow it away if you don't blow hard enough it drops down simples so there are all sorts of games you can play there are lots of different tools and tricks you can use I said the straw in water you can get things like a flow ball I've got one um, no I haven't got it lurking there it's in my special bag of tricks which I haven't got time to get out but there are there are plenty of tools I can get to that later if we've got time breath management one thing onset all right so this is the thing to do with the vocal folds not coming together cleanly so we work on that closure at the start of the sound the easiest way to do that is to do a glottal onset ah uh, ah uh, ah uh. we do it in speech when we go uh oh uh oh that's a glottal onset it's not aggressive it's not going to cause any harm it's only harmful if it's really hard uh, uh, like that if we do it maybe linked into straining or pushing but just as a little click in the sound e, 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 o, e, e, and you can hear the sound that comes after the click is always clean it's always clean and clear because the click is bringing the vocal folds together before the air goes through so we're getting that closure we only get a click with complete closure so that's a very useful little tool um, another one is creak onset uh, that creaky door sound that we make with very relaxed larynx if you use that to start the sound uh, 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 Okay, it's a, it's a bit of a, a leap about. What you're actually doing is throwing chaos into the system. And you throw chaos into the system, and then when they come together in order, it'll be different. Because they'll be, they won't be going back to their old familiar habits and patterns. You've just shaken everything up and said, right, we'll start afresh. Every single note, we start afresh and we find a better way to do it. So that's a very useful therapeutic technique. Um, third thing that's going to help is resonance work. So getting a little bit of eh 
twangy resonance in the sound. How do we do that? We play, we play with meowing and quacking and all of those sort of noises, whining, whinging, all of those will get that bright, penetrating focus in the sound, which you can only do with complete closure of the vocal folds. You cannot do a twangy sound on breathy phonation. We all sorts of ways of getting to that, but it's mostly just playing with sounds and being imaginative and, and letting your hair down and being an idiot tends to help. Um, what about exploring the full upper pitch range? Often an issue with children who are a little bit reluctant to go up into the upper pitch range. Um, we play again with pretending to be different animals, pretending to be different kind of space rockets, pretending to be um, insects, being um, you know anything, whatever they're into, take them on a journey. Take them on an imaginative journey, making the sounds to go with it. And as long as it's light and easy and playful and fun, and also uh, a bit of role play will help them get out of their own self-consciousness. So that was a quick whiz through a few technical ideas for children, but also for adult voices. What else do we find with younger singers singing in tune? Um, the research suggests that girls are better than boys. Don't know why? They, for some reason, tend to sing in tune more than boys. Whatever it is, the older they get, the better they get. There was some um, lots of research that came out of the Sing Up program uh, that was running sort of 15 years ago in schools. And the more singing that children do, the better they get at it. Amazing. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you want them to sing in tune more easily, do more singing with them. If it's a real issue, and this can be singers of any age, remember that it's not just hearing. If somebody's not singing in tune, it's very unlikely that they've got a problem hearing what they're doing. It's more that they've got a problem matching the sensations of what they're doing. Um, because our hear, our, our perception of what we're doing with our own voice is as much to do with with the vibrations as it is to do with what it sounds like. We need to match a human voice at the same pitch. Banging a note on the piano won't do any good at all. It needs to be a human voice demonstrating because it's got a very different range of frequencies in it at the same pitch. And the most effective way is to match the student to match the singer ask them to sing a little fragment of a phrase the first line of happy birthday whatever it is and then ask them to sing it again and match what they have given you and then they will get used to the sensation of pitch matching so you meet them on their terms rather than trying to drag them into yours Tightness, constriction, overworking, movement, 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 movement. If the tightness is in the larynx, okay, and that's that's a tight larynx. I'm not tight here. I'm tight inside. But if I loosen around on the outside, the message goes through. Muscles, adjacent muscles will tend to co-opt each other. So if a muscle is overworking, the ones around it will be overworking too. So we loosen the ones around it and everything will let go. Silent in-breath. Take a breath in without any sound and everything has to get out of the way. You have to open up and deconstrict. That's all you need to do. Um, puffy cheeks. Ooh. 
that's a really good exercise for deconstructing because you tend to use less effort in the larynx. And that applies to anything um, in a similar vein, like singing through a straw, or singing through a kazoo, or singing through um, a vorjoz, fricative sounds. It's a whole range. <coughs> Any of those. Um, and having a good laugh as well. Right, so, girls voices. Adolescent girls' voices. Um, this is, I just have to preface this, when I'm talking about girls' voices and boys' voices, I'm talking about cis female girls. All right, this, so this is not purely people who identify as female, this is people who have the hormones for the female voice. And the same for the boys. Um, trans voices are a different talk. We haven't got time to go there. This is what they will sound like. So this is a girl, 12 years old. There once was a young rat named Arthur who would never take the trouble to make up his mind. When none of his friends asked him if he would like to go out with them, he would only answer, I don't know. Could you all hear that all right? Yep. This is the trouble sent from above. So you hear the speaking and the singing. A little bit breathy. There was once a young rat named Arthur who would never take the trouble to make up his mind. Whenever his friends asked him if he would go out, go, like to go out with them, he would only answer, I don't know. This is the truth sent from above. A year later, she's cleared up a lot of the breathiness. There once was a young rat named Arthur, who would never take the trouble to make up his mind. Whenever his friends asked him if he would like to go out with them, he would only answer, I don't know. So there, you can hear in her singing voice is much stronger and more mature. Her speaking voice, she's developed a creak. Yeah, she's talking down there a bit. Now that's just a social affectation. There's nothing wrong with her voice. It's just that all her friends are doing that and it's really cool. Um, I've got some more recordings, but I'm going to whiz through because we're running low on time. Boys. Adolescent boys, what happens? It's a gradual change. It's growth. It doesn't, you can't grow overnight when you can, but not very much. Um, just as a really simple guide, feet grow first. Uh, and you know this, if you look at, um, a year eight or year nine class. The boys have they've got monstrous feet, but they're not that tall. And then two or three years later, everything seems to have sort of caught up with itself. So feet grow first, and then the long bones, and then the laryngeal cartilages. So you've got a bit of lead time. If you know, if they've suddenly had to get new shoes, there's a possibility that in three or four months time, their larynx will grow. So you can just bear that in mind when you're planning what part they're going to be singing, whether they're going to be able to do the solos in the Christmas concert, all of those sort of considerations. Look at their feet. Um, I have a, a colleague who runs a boys choir who has a new shoe club and whenever they get new shoes they come and show her. And they know exactly what it's about and they know and they also have their voice pitch analyzer to track their voice pitch and they, it's just a, a great game that they play they know they know what's going on and this is what happens with the voices and we have to listen to the speaking voice 
to assess them. All right, this is a complicated chart. By the way, I can give you these slides at the end. I didn't send them in advance. I'm really sorry, apologies for that. Don't write anything down. I'll just pop the slides over for you. Um, the Again, we've got the speaking pitch here on the cross, gradually going down. Um, the female adolescence, it does apply, but it's much smaller. The female growth is about 30%, the male growth is 65% of the larynx. So that's why you get the massive, the massive change. Um, this gradual lowering of the speaking voice and of course the singing voice gradually going down with it. So once you know these stages, you know where the boy is going to be comfortable singing. Um, now he can probably sing up here. If he's used to singing, he will still be able to produce high notes. And this is where it's really, really important to listen to his speaking voice. Because it's not how high he can sing, it's where is his voice most comfortable. Because this is a, a system that is growing and changing really rapidly. And we don't want to put it into something that is limiting. I often describe it, it's like making boys wear shoes that are too small for them. Right? You wouldn't say, okay, year seven have to wear size seven shoes. Year eight can wear size nine shoes. Year 10 have to wear, and you, you wouldn't dream of doing that. You say, what size are your feet? Same with the voice. You, know, you don't allocate voice parts according to how old they are. You allocate them according to where their comfortable range is. And this recording, this is um, very usefully my son. They, it does, it comes in handy when you breed your own samples. This is his speaking voice over a two year period, just taken in chunks and then spliced together. So this is two years of voice growth in just over a minute. There was once a young rat named Arthur who would never take the trouble to make up his mind. Whenever his friends asked him if he would like to go out with them, he would only answer, I don't know. He wouldn't say yes, and he wouldn't say no either. He could never learn to make a choice. His Aunt Helen said to him, No one will ever care for you if you carry on like this. You have no more mind than a blade of grass. Arthur looked wise, but said nothing. One rainy day, the rats heard a great noise in the loft where they lived. The pine rafters were all rotten, and at last one of the joists had given way and fallen to the ground. The walls shook, and the rat's hair stood on end with fear and horror. This won't do, said the old rat, who was chief. I'll send out scouts to search for a new home. Three hours later, the seven scouts came back and said, we found a stone house, which is just what we wanted. There's room and good food for us all. There's a kindly horse named Nelly, a cow, a calf, and a garden with an elm tree. And that kind of sums it up, I think, better than any description. <laughs> you hear it there, two years of growth. Gradual, um, not consistent, it's not linear, it goes in spurts. You'll get a sudden growth spurt and then it sits still for a three or four months and then you get a sudden growth spurt where the, the pitch will go a little bit unstable and lower a little more. But that's all it is and throughout that whole process the boy can sing and love singing and feel valued and important and useful and all of those things. There's no reason to ever stop singing during that process. We're whizzing on. <laughs> We've done adolescence. Now, adult voices. Okay, we're going to start with adult females, which of course does cover female adolescence. Okay, so there's a little bit of an overlap here. The adult female is living on a hormonal roller coaster from about the age of 10 to about the age of 60. Um, what does that feel like and why? Well, this is just a little interesting little fact. Did you know that your vocal folds and your cervix have an awful lot of similarities? Um, and they 
show the same changes with hormone changes over the monthly cycle. So when you have um, a lot of oestrogen mid-month, you have a very flexible, supple larynx. When you have a drop of oestrogen and more progesterone at the end of the month, things get sticky, things get slightly edematous, things don't work as well. And it's exactly the same in the cervix as it is in the larynx. And this is this sort of crazy theory that we might actually be signalling our fertility with our voice. Uh, which is all very well, but we don't always want to be signalling our fertility, we just want to be getting on and singing. So this is where our voice is happiest, mid-month. Everything's working much more easily. And then at the just before the menstrual period, in the first day or two of the menstrual period, things get more difficult. Um, the, um, the blood flow decreases slightly, so we're more likely to get pooling and edema. We get thicker mucus. All right? When we feel claggy, it's not because we've got more mucus, it's because we've got thicker mucus. All right? Mucus is fine, mucus is great, but we just want it to be runny, please. What about later on, perimenopause, which is the sort of time, you know, it can be two years, it can be five years, it can be ten years, and we often don't know we're in it because we're still having a monthly cycle. And that's when you think you're going mad, when you've got these dreadful symptoms, things are all over the place, you know, mood swings, whatever. And you'll get differences in your voice. You may well get a sensation of dryness. You may get decreased efficiency, change in pitch range, pitch unpredictability. Also, the other symptoms that you will get obviously get in the way of you trying to sing and be a member of a choir or conduct a choir or whatever you're doing. This is really important information for everybody. Right, this isn't just for middle-aged women. Right, everybody needs to know this stuff. Menopause is... Uh, the, the definition of menopause is after your last menstrual period. Um, and this is when things can stabilise, but they may stabilise in a way that you're not so happy with. Um, again, dryness, pitch uncertainty, decreased efficiency many of those things. Um, there are hormone replacement therapy can often help but not everybody is in a position to take that. There are conversations you can have with your doctor. Um, there are ways to relieve these things but it's still anything from a minor inconvenience to a major life trauma. Then after that we get older. Um, these are the three most uh, important factors in keeping you alive healthy for longer. The most significant factor in longevity is the number of friends you've got, your community support. That is over and above whether you smoke, whether you're overweight, whether you, any of those issues, whether you've got heart problems, over and above all of those, if you have a good community support, you will live longer and healthier. What are we doing in choirs? Providing that community support. This is why choral singing is so important for people to be able to carry on with. This is why we've, we've really struggled in the last year and a half and this is why we are all doing our utmost to get back together again. It's the most important thing. The next most important thing is lifestyle factors. And the third most important thing is having daughters. If you have daughters, you will live longer than if you have sons. Work that one out. So what happens to the voices? Um, 
the <laughs> I love the comments coming in. Um, respiratory function diminishes. So between forty and eighty, your respiratory function goes down by one percent a year. Right, that's that's significant over time. Uh, that's one percent of where you are each year, like um, um, interest rates. Um, you know, like your mortgage. It's it's not one percent of where you were when you were forty each year. Um, but it still it means that you can take you need to breathe more frequently that's all just breathe more often atrophy things get weaker all right and your vocal folds will get weaker the muscles in the vocal folds and the muscles around them will get weaker this is why people can have swallowing problems as they get older because we're relying on the muscles in the throat to close tight every time we swallow and for the larynx to shut down and if it's not so strong at doing that it can cause problems um, and we get a bit huskier we get a reduced pitch range because the muscles aren't as strong and sometimes we can get breathiness in the sound arthritis will uh, have an impact on your voice because everything's a little bit stiffer and that's in the larynx itself so the cricothyroid and the cricarotene are, are joints within the larynx itself um, and of course in the the vertebrae where the ribs are connected that will also stiffen all the cartilages here in the larynx get more bony as we get older which means that they just get less flexible and we have a reduced nerve supply. Basically, the nerves, the, the nerves just die off. So we have fewer nerves going to the muscles, which means there's a slower response, which is why we have um, a more wide and slow vibrato when we're older. It's just the, the, the nerve supply to the vocal folds. That's all. Males, in particular, I mean, this is this is for my, you know, this is eighty plus. Uh, there's a greater noticeable atrophy in male voices. They tend to go thinner and more reedy. Um, Shakespeare got it with pipes and whistles in his sound in the, the Seven Ages of Man. Um, hyperfunction is when you squeeze and try too hard. Yeah, if everything's got a bit weaker and you can't make yourself heard and your wife is hard of hearing, which is, you know, very, very common with older couples, everything becomes a strain and it'll be squeezed and it'll be pushed and then it's very difficult because things get very tired very quickly. Um, Ageing female voices will tend to go down in pitch because there's slightly more swelling. Again you may have hyperfunction and constriction. Um, Kerry has asked about thoracic damage. Do you mean thoracic or thoracic? Um, thoracic, the so spinal thoracic cord. Okay, thoracic. Um, yes, probably. <laughs> but there is good news with all of this. Because the more you sing, the less you, these symptoms will happen. The, the more you use it, the more you keep the function going. If you use muscles, they will atrophy less. If you use the nerves, they will diminish less. Okay? You can't stop the aging process, but you can slow it down. Um, this is just a pitch pitch chart of what happens over the lifetime all right so this is it's a just a, a sound it's not an actual voice but this is what the male voice does okay each click is 10 years all right i'll play that again this is what the female voice does
And this is both together. <laughs> All right, bit of fun, but at the end of that, they're the same. And you know that if you go into an old people's home, the men and the women have the same speaking pitch, very similar speaking pitch. So we end up in the same place. So use it or lose it is the advice. Carry on singing. You may need to reconsider what voice part you sing. It's very difficult to carry on singing soprano, high soprano, into your 80s. It's not impossible, some people do, but most women <clears throat> will drop down through the parts where they feel more comfortable and actually can contribute better. Um, you may need to reconsider which choir is best for you. If you sing in a choir that is very um, competitive and you have to do difficult audition to get in, it may not always be the one that is best for you. And also keep up overall levels of exercise. The more you exercise, the more you move your body, the better you will sing. Um, how reversible are the ageing changes, Paula says. Well, um, it depends how much is use and how much is organic. If once the nerves have died off, they're probably not going to grow back. But you can do the best with the ones that you've got. So if you've developed a big wobble, if you can, you can then work on your technique. You can work on your breathing. You can work on getting the muscles to come together very efficiently and you may well reduce that. All right, you won't eliminate it, but you may reduce it. So you can always improve on everything. Um, exercise helps. Now, of course, I've whizzed through things and leapt over quite a lot of information. What, is there anything you would like me to go back on and talk about a bit more? I can go back to teenage girls, I can go back to um, teenage Ginevra, boys, I've got more recordings to share. Could you give us some more examples of some sort of exercises and things that we can do to help with breathiness and onset and those kinds of things? Um, certainly, what I would do is I'll stop sharing the screen because we don't need the pictures. and. Exercises. Exercises for, um, I, well, the breathiness ones, if you, um, okay, I've got a really good one that I didn't put in, and that's bursting bubbles. The The puffy cheeks one is, is one of my all-time favourites, and that's where you sing, we can all try it, you sing, the sound comes out of your lips, but your mouth is mostly closed. Ooh. And it's gentle, it's not you're not pushing, it's a very gentle closure of the lips. And you can sing whole tunes through puffy cheeks. If you then put so when we're singing with the puffy cheeks, what we've got is the vocal folds are coming together very, very efficiently. You then add in a ba 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 ba. Now that ba sound you can only make ba if your soft palate is lifted and it gives you the, the basically it's like a glottal onset but with the lips yeah Clo complete closure with a pop ba 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 so we then introduce that at the end of the slide and we do ba ba and you do a really gentle pop i call it bursting bubbles because it's very very gentle Yep. It's not an explosion. It's just a gentle pop. And the sound that comes out on the R will pretty well always be clear and light. So it won't be breathy and it won't be squeezed. 
if whatever you do with the voice, it still comes out sounding breathy or husky, that may be evidence of a vocal health issue. So that may be the vocal folds are slightly inflamed. It may be that there's the beginning of a pathology there. Um, if you absolutely can't get rid of the breathiness or huskiness, whatever you do, then that might be a bit of an alert, a bit of a red flag to go and get this looked at. Any other questions? Oh, I know one. <laughs> I'll answer my, ask my own question. Talking of inflamed vocal folds, all right, if we get tired, if we've overused the voice, um, the, basically the vocal folds come together like this. Yeah. Uh, the, my vocal folds are colliding about 200 times a second as I'm speaking to you now, so that's quite a lot of collisions. If you take that over a day, that's loads. Um, women's voices, because they're slightly higher pitched than men's voices, will vibrate more times per day. Okay, So that's just because of the higher fundamental frequency. So that's one of the reasons why women's voices are more prone to voice problems. One of the reasons. Um, so they're colliding. If I bash them together harder, like if I'm speaking very loudly or singing very loudly, yep, that's going to be more tiring for them. Uh, if I'm using them more, more per day, that's also going to be tiring. So that fatigue will probably be inflammation. Because if we bash together, if you clap your hands together really hard, they will tingle and feel a little bit hot. And if you imagine doing that for a hours on end they'll be slightly inflamed it's the way that the tissues mend themselves it's part of the healing process is for fluid to come in all around so there'll be slight swelling slight inflammation in the vocal folds if you've overused them how do we um, eliminate that well there are two things that you can do really useful things one is give yourself mini breaks so if you have a one hour rehearsal and you have lots and lots of one or two minute breaks through that, your voice will recover better than if you have one long break in the middle. So mini breaks all the way through. If you're a classroom teacher uh, and you're using your voice to give a lesson, give yourself mini breaks, times when the kids are doing quiet work where you're listening to something, where they're doing the speaking. Actually work it out and timetable it in. If you are taking a choir rehearsal, don't sing along with the choir. Yeah, they sing, you sing, they sing, you sing. Give yourself mini breaks. So that's one thing you can do. And the other thing is you can do these pitch glides. <laughs> Go right from the bottom to the very top, to the bottom, to the very top, to the bottom. Just do that for a minute or so. And it gives the vocal folds a good stretch and massage. And stretch and massage will reduce the inflammatory markers on the vocal folds. It will reduce the inflammation. In the same way that stretch and massage reduces inflammation of any soft tissue injury in the body. So there's a couple of tips for a tired voice. Um, I haven't talked much about other vocal health tips. Um, I will tell you now, this you'll all hate me for this, there's nothing that you can eat or drink that will harm your voice or help your voice. As long as you're hydrated enough and you've got enough fluid in you, there's nothing that you can eat or drink that will help. And there's nothing that you can, apart from alcohol, of course, which will um, mainly dull your cognitive abilities. So you think you're brilliant and you're actually not. Um, but other than that, you know, don't stress about it. Don't worry about it. There's, um, there's nothing that you can really do to harm your voice. Apart from overusing it, using it too loudly, the main factor that features in all vocal health and vocal problems is anxiety. If you're worried about something, 
whether it's an underlying niggle or whether it's a massive trauma, whatever it is, it will affect your voice. And knowing that means that you can be a little bit kinder to yourself. And if things are difficult, know that your voice will be also struggling a little and just be nice to yourself. Uh, more things in the chat. We're nearly out of time. Uh, ease the transition from chest voice to head voice. Uh, mm. <laughs> yes, not in 30 seconds. Um, go gently and practice a lot. Gently. It's a little bit like doing a gear change in the car. If you're driving a, um, a non-automatic stick shift car and you're driving without a clutch, have you ever tried that? You can drive without a clutch if you match the revs exactly. And it's a little bit like that. You're just matching the revs as you go across. And then you can get it more smooth. It's a coordination issue. Um, no, not Dutch courage. It's not, you know, I mean, you can do what you like, but it's not recommended. How do you maintain the clear sound you can achieve with an exercise through a whole song? Practice. <laughs> do sing the whole song on puffy cheeks. Sing the whole song on an open vowel. Sing it all on a brrrr. Just play with it. Do all sorts of different things and see where the blips are. See where it goes crunchy and see where it's easy. Then you can work on the crunchy bits and you can make them more easy by doing them to other sounds. Are we Thank there? You. I think so. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. I think everybody, I've, there's been some amazing um, comments in the chat. I think everyone's found that really, really interesting. Um, thank you for doing that. And um, you do other courses, don't you? If anyone was interested in finding out more, then um, do they go to your website? Yes, I didn't put a big, any of that on the um, thingy. <laughs> <laughs> Self-promotion. Um, Okay, my name is on the thing. If you spell it right, put it into a search engine, you come up with me and nobody else. And um, my website has got information. Vocal Health Education has got all the courses for people who want to do more training in this, either from the Vocal Health First Aid, the sort of ground level work, right up through to full rehabilitation work. Um, the other courses that I do are all on hold at the moment because I'm putting them all online and having to record them all. So that's why there's a bit of a, um, a stall on that. But there's loads going on. I'm here. I can answer questions. I'm very happy to do individual work with people. Or if you want to get together a small group, I can do that. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Can we just um, say thank you? <laughs> Thank you for coming and joining us over the weekend. It's been absolutely fascinating and brilliant to see you. And what I'll do is I'll pop these, I'll, I'll make the slides into a handout really quickly and um, email it to you, Nikki. Thank you. In the next 10 minutes. Nikki, may we, get a, may we get a picture with Ginevra? With everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Go. We smile, that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> there it is. I've got one. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank lovely. you very, very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, Irene. Bye, everybody. Enjoy Bye. the rest of your weekend and your workshops. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.